um, good afternoon, everybody. Uh, my name is Scott Burley. Uh, I've been working on uh, DTN for uh, a long time, sort of since the, the beginning when we, we started uh, talking about it in uh, uh, 1998. Um, and what I'll be talking about today is um, a, a, an application of uh, the DTN architecture um, that um, I, I think the, the, the discussion will um, echo on a number of the things that have already come up during the presentation so far today. It, it is a, about using DTN in space, but it, it's also very much about uh, using DTN to improve the conditions of, of, of people on Earth. It's about uh, terrestrial applications for DTN that are supported from space. Um, so I'll get into that now. Um, there's a uh, the, the the backbone of, of this talk, I guess, is a, a proposal for infrastructure, a, a constellation of uh, what are called nano satellites, very small uh, Earth orbiting satellites uh, that would use delay tolerant networking to provide uh, low cost network access uh, universally uh, across uh, most of the globe. Uh, I'll uh, go through a, an illustration of how that uh, infrastructure would function. And uh, I'll go through some details on what I think the, the capacity of, the, of, of that infrastructure could be, what the costs of, of deploying that infrastructure would be, um, and, uh, and as a result of, of those, sort of what the, um, what, what the, a lot of what the benefit of, of the infrastructure would be in terms of uh, providing very economical network access. Um, I will then sort of talk a little bit about uh, the application uh, operational latency in that network and some applications that I think would work just fine despite that latency, which I think uh, kind of motivates uh, uh, development of, of, of the uh, infrastructure that I'm talking about. Um, uh, sort of closing with uh, uh, stepping back a little bit and having a, a broader perspective on, on what it is to use a network and, and what that means and, and a little bit on uh, caveats and, and the outlook for this, uh, this idea. So um, the, the, the concept I'm working with here is uh, using satellites for universal network access. Um, we all know already that uh, Earth orbiting satellites can, radio, uh, can relay radio communications among sites on Earth, which is a great way of, of, of providing communication from any point on Earth to any other point on Earth through Earth orbiting satellites. They have the advantage of being visible from all points on Earth's surface, depending on what the orbit inclination is. Uh, and they, they, and a, as such, they remove the, uh, a lot of the geographical and, and potentially political obstacles from communication. You, you, the communication can easily span national boundaries. Um, it, it can uh, reach into uh, 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 parts of the world that, uh, where uh, political considerations may be shutting down other kinds of network access. And this is not a new idea. There's plenty of satellites up there now. There are uh, loads of geostationary satellites that are, are providing uh, uh, communication service to, the, uh, to large parts of, of the planet, uh, Viasat, uh, HughesNet, uh, Intelsat, Inmarsat. And there also are uh, low Earth orbiting, or LEO, um, constellations uh, that, uh, that are in a sort of structurally entirely different but also are providing uh, service to uh, large swaths of uh, Earth's surface. Things like Global Star, Iridium, uh, Orbcom, Teledesic was doing it, it's out of business now, but there's still, you know, there's still other, other uh, constellations that are in business. So is the problem solved then? Because we've got constellations, we've got satellites, what's, what, what else is the problem? And the, the, the problem here is that maintaining internet connections with satellites is absolutely doable, but it's not necessarily easy. With uh, geosynchronous satellites, uh, the satellite is in one place uh, over the, the same point on, on Earth's surface at all times, which geosynchronous means. Uh, and so you can maintain continuous radio contact with the ground station, between ground stations and customer equipment through that, that, that satellite. But those satellites are uh, very expensive on the order of 300 to a million or more uh, to manufacture and launch. Uh, each satellite provides communication to a limited part of Earth's surface because it's only visible from a certain part of the surface because it's geostationary. That may be a large uh, part of Earth's surface, but still, it is limited. Uh, each one is a single point of failure because they're expensive. You don't have an awful lot of them. If 
if one of them goes down, then that, that's that's a, a, a large part of your um, uh, of your infrastructure that is now not working. And while the data rights data rates over uh, geosynchronous connections are, are very high, the round trip latencies are also high because they're in such high orbits. Um, a mitigation for this is to use uh, low Earth orbiting satellite constellations. Uh, the, these are satellites that are only on the order of uh, oh, 500 kilometers up, and uh, they don't stay in one point in the sky. They're crossing the sky all the time. Uh, but if you have enough of them, then they can maintain connections, internet connections between points on Earth's surface by, by maintaining communication among themselves and switching the conversations as satellites rise in the east and set in the west. Uh, this enables you to have broad coverage areas and low latencies because they're very close to the Earth. Uh, the data rates are lower than for geosynchronous uh, orbits. Um, you need a lot more satellites because they only are visible for brief periods of time, and they're still expensive. Uh, the manufacture and launch of an Iridium satellite, has, uh, the last I checked, was on the order of 150 to 200 million dollars. There, there's a lot of money involved in, in deploying these things. So, um, an alternative would be use uh, something that's emerged over the last. Well, decade, maybe a little bit less than that, a, a, a nano satellite, a tiny satellite. Uh, the m most widely uh, adopted uh, s uh, model for these things is, is something called a CubeSat, which is was developed uh, at Cal Poly San Luis Obispo and Stanford several years ago, and was developed as a, as a teaching tool for aerospace students. Um, it's a satellite, you know, the, the, that thing on the table there, that's an entire satellite. It's a satellite that's um, 10 centimeters on a, on a, on a side, it's a cube, and it weighs about a, kil a kilogram, and th these things have been launched and they go into orbit and they have radios in them and they can talk to Earth. Uh, they're a terrific teaching tool for students, but uh, increasingly they're being appreciated as, um, as actual infrastructure that uh, uh, national space agencies, military, uh, uh, there are a number of applications that the, the the rate of launch of uh, these CubeSats is uh, sort of growing exponentially over the last few years. If you had a constellation of these inexpensive nanosatellites um, in low Earth orbit, well, you could cover a, a large um, area of, 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 of the Earth's surface, and you'd have no single point of failure because there's lots of satellites, uh, and, and be very inexpensive. So that sounds like a great idea, except that there's a catch there. There's always a catch. And that is that, that these uh, nano satellites, these, these tiny communication satellites, the reason they're so inexpensive is that they're small and they're simple. There's not a lot to them. So the capability to, to do the, um, uh, the conversation switching, the, the connection switching that you get from uh, the Iridium satellites, it's very difficult to replicate that in, in the tiny form factor of these little satellites. Uh, typically, they have very limited maneuverability on orbit. Uh, they normally only have a single radio, it, which is typically just a UHF radio. And, and so the, the connection switching across the cross-linked satellites that you get from a, a LEO constellation, you, you can't uh, readily get from, from a constellation of these, these nano satellites. And so uh, you, you can't reasonably expect a constellation of low-cost nano satellites to be able to sustain uh, even a small number, much less thousands or, or millions of continuous end-to-end -end internet connections. It's just not a good way to, to run the internet. All right, so how do we solve that catch? Uh, and what I will suggest here is that maintaining continuous end-to-end -end internet connections is not the only possible valuable network service to, to people using network applications on Earth. And that's kind of the, the basis for the rest of what I'm going to be talking about. Uh, DTN. Uh, which we've talked about a little bit already today, uh, would enable a different model. At each moment, uh, each of the satellites that's over some point on Earth, uh, its radio would be in contact with some point directly below it. Uh, while the satellite and that ground station are in contact, data would flow between the satellite and the ground station, just between the satellite and the ground station. The satellite would function as a router, but it would function as a store and forward router. That is, the data sent from the ground 
to some other point in the network by way of the satellite would reach the satellite and stay there because the satellite is not connected to anything else. The satellite would hold the data in memory and the satellite's physical movement along its orbital track would constitute essentially transmission of the data. When contact with the next ground station begins, network traffic exchange would resume with that ground station and maybe some of the data that the, the satellite is holding in memory would go to the ground, maybe some would, uh, would remain until a, a, a subsequent contact with, with another ground station. There might be some new contact uh, added. And it's very much like uh, the, the uh, data mule model that uh, Maria was talking about earlier today. The satellite functions as a, as a high-speed data mule in the sky. Uh, and so uh, because of the sort of circular nature of these orbits and, and because they, they, they sort of ring uh, the, 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 the planet, I, I, I've been calling this, the, this concept ring road. And, and, and I'll go through a, a little demonstration here of a, a very you know, crummy uh, cartoon demonstration of, of, of how this kind of thing would work. Um, the nomenclature on here, the, the dark red uh, uh, circles are what I refer to as hot spots. That is, these are um, uh, nodes of this uh, nanosat-based uh, infrastructure that are connected to the internet and are also able to intercommunicate with the satellites. The satellites are the green guys uh, that are termed couriers in this uh, architecture. The dark blue guys are uh, cold spots. That is, they're able to talk to the satellites, but they're not able to talk on the internet. They may have uh, other devices connected to them over a local area network, but they're disconnected from the internet. The pale blue things are, are, are nodes that are neither uh, connected to the internet nor to the satellites. They, they would use the cold spot to talk to the satellites. And the, and the sort of pinkish pale red uh, uh, nodes here are, are things that are connected to the internet but not to the satellites. They would use the hotspots to be able to talk ultimately to the cold spots. So uh, as an example of, of downloading a file using this infrastructure, uh, let's take this, this picture here. Uh, we've got a, a user at, at uh, do I have a, ah, there, I do have a mouse, good. We have a user at, at Node X here that, that um, has a, uh, w is requesting a file. This little blob is the file request. And here's the file that it wants to, to download. This guy wants to download this file. And he can't do it because he's on a local area network that's not connected to the internet. So uh, what he does is uh, request the file in this delay tolerant uh, constellation mechanism. And that, that uh, file request is routed over the local area network to cold spot A, that is his cold spot, the one that, that connects him to the rest of the world. And, and it sits at cold spot A waiting for a satellite overflight. Well, fortunately, satellite number two, courier number two, is pretty close. So uh, shortly thereafter, here comes satellite two. And now uh, the request can be uploaded from the cold spot to the satellite. And, uh, and it goes into memory in the, in the satellite, in the courier. And, and it just sits there waiting for contact with a hotspot. So the courier satellite continues on its path. Uh, for a while, it can't talk to anything at all. And now it, now it reaches hotspot B. Because it's reached a, a hotspot, it can exchange data with a node that's connected to the internet. And that means that the request for the file can go to the hotspot and then immediately to node C, which uh, uh, owns the file traveling over the internet. Uh, the node at C says, oh, OK, I can, I can provide that file, and uh, determines that the earliest way to get the, the, the file to where it's supposed to go, which is by way of cold spot A back to X, is by way of courier 3 the next time it comes into contact with hotspot D. That's the next uh, hotspot on the, on the that's the next career on the next hotspot. So uh, to, to uh, forward the file, what he does is forward the file not back to B, but rather to, to hotspot D, where it waits for uh, not 
Courier 2, but Courier 3, which is further advanced, to approach. Courier 3 arrives. Uh, the hotspot uploads the file to Courier 3, and now it resides in the memory of Courier 3. It continues on his orbital path. It comes into contact with cold spot E, doesn't do anything with the file because E is not connected to X. Continues holding it, still holding it, still holding it. Now it comes into contact with cold spot A, and so it, it, it's able to, uh, f to download it to A, which can immediately route it to client X. So what we have here is uh, a quite familiar request and delivery of a file between uh, nodes that are not connected by the internet using satellites that are not conducting internet uh, communication, they're conveying the data in a data mule sense. So um, what would this look like then to, to, to make this workable? Um, I, I worked with a, a, a couple of guys at the Johns Hopkins uh, uh, University uh, Applied Physics Laboratory um, to uh, uh, come up with uh, parameters for the constellation that uh, would make it uh, usable. Uh, what we settled on was, uh, first of all, the courier satellites being in uh, near circular low Earth orbits at inclination of about 50 degrees. Uh, as, uh, as as Maria was saying earlier, that's that uh, I think that's right. That oh no, as uh, um, as as we talked about in the ISS uh, discussion, that that covers about 95 percent of the Earth's population in in that 50 north to 50 south range of of uh, latitudes. Uh, the altitude would be about 500 kilometers, and at that at that altitude, the radius of satellite visibility that is how much of the ground can see the satellite and the satellite can see uh, at, at any moment would be a little bit greater than uh, 1,000 kilometers. So the, the diameter of the circle underneath the satellite at any time would be about, about 2,000 kilometers diameter. So the maximum separation of the satellites would be at the equator, which is about 40,000 kilometers. So if we had 10 orbital planes, uh, each of the planes crosses that the, the equator twice, and so each plane covers uh, uh, 4,000 uh, uh, kilometers of diameter of, 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 the, surf, of the, the equator. And so if you have 10 of those, then, then you've covered the entire equator. Uh, each satellite would um, cross the equator twice per orbit. Uh, the coverage per satellite at the equator would be about 18 degrees of longitude. Uh, if you had 12 satellites per orbital plane, uh, then that would be 18 degrees of latitude uh, as well. But I'm figuring here 15 so that there's a little bit of overlap in, in the coverage. And so that would come to 150 spacecraft in all. And Vint has a Could question now. Sure. I meant, no, I, uh, I, I've been confused by this myself a couple times, and I think this is right. It's, it's a thousand kilometers radius, two thousand diameter, but because it crosses the equator twice, it on you know coming down here, it's 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 covering two thousand, right? And up here, it's covering another two thousand, so that's four thousand altogether. Uh, okay, so 150 uh, spacecraft. Uh, Satellites at uh, 500 kilometers altitude travel at about 7.8 kilometers a second, uh, which gives you an orbital period of about 90 minutes, which is 16 orbits per day. So any single satellite would be in view of any single ground station for a maximum of 256 seconds. Uh, that's satellite rise to satellite set. Uh, if we used S-band transceivers, uh, which is shortwave essentially, uh, in the satellites, uh, we, I believe we can pretty readily get uh, 230 kilobits per second. And so during that 256 seconds of contact, you could, from a, a ground station, from a, a cold spot or a hot spot, upload up to 7.4 megabytes in a single contact. Um, there would be up to 20 contacts of that maximum length per orbit. So uh, you could upload almost 150 megabytes uh, per satellite um, per orbit, and so uh, about 2.4 gigabytes per satellite per day could be inserted into the network. So for 150 satellites, that comes to about 360 gigabytes inserted into the network per day, which is about uh, 4 megabytes per second, 32 megabits a second. Now that's not 
really fast compared to the internet. And this was not a big surprise because we're using quite slow radios. Uh, and it actually wouldn't be that fast because you figure that, that 50 north to 50 south latitude, a lot of the time you're over the ocean and there might not be anything listening. There might not be anything there. So you might not have, you might be wasting some of that opportunity to upload data. So what I've said here is let's, let's assume that there's something in the ocean from time to time, but not all that much. And so just divide it by two and, and figure roughly 16 megabits per second of, of, of traffic uh, on a continuous basis into the network. Uh, at that rate, well, uh, coming back to the, the, the cost of, of deployment, CubeSats are really cheap. You actually can uh, go to a company called Pumpkin on the uh, internet and you can buy a CubeSat uh, chassis for like $4,000. You can, there are, uh, there's a, there, the, a company called Tyvek in uh, uh, San Luis Obispo will sell you an entire, uh, the whole, whole uh, CubeSat ready to fly, uh, except for instruments for, I believe, something like $45,000. So we're estimating here an assembly cost of $100,000 to allow for, uh, maybe it's a two unit instead of a, a one unit uh, device, maybe there's an expensive radio. It's a, it's a rough estimate and it could easily be off by 50% uh, either way. Um, but working with that number, we came up with a, a total a satellite assembly cost of about $15 million. Um, we estimated that the cost to launch three CubeSats uh, would be about $200,000 for three. So that'd be uh, 50 of those, that's about $10 million to launch 150 CubeSats. And that price may actually be coming down because there's a growing commercial spaceflight market, things like Virgin Galactic, Sierra Nevada, SpaceX, where they, they really are, are seeking uh, payloads to put into orbit. Uh, I think the uh, the, the trend in launch cost for these things is, is uh, definitely downward. Um, so uh, then the other part is ground stations, uh, assuming about 20 contacts per orbit, 150 satellites, you need 3,000 uh, base stations to occupy all of those contacts. But again, because it's only half the Earth's surface, uh, you, you only really are, are having half of those, let's say. So let's say 1,500 uh, base stations. Uh, the base station just run, needs to run the protocols and a shortwave radio, essentially. So um, laptops, if, if you buy them in bulk, that's, they can be pretty cheap. So I'm guessing here that uh, the base station would be something like $2,000 for every hot spot and cold spot. So the total base station cost of the network, I'm guessing here, is uh, on the order of $3 million. Now suppose that the network lifetime is, is five years. Suppose we can keep these satellites uh, going for five years and, and just picking a number out of the air, let's say it costs a million dollars a year to operate the network. Uh, uh, people that are monitoring the network and uh, uh, updating routing tables and that sort of thing. Um, in that case, adding it all up, the total lifetime cost of the network is 15 plus 10 plus three plus five, $33 million. Um, at 16 megabits a second, uh, the total lifetime traffic over five years would be about 300 terabytes. And so that comes to a mean cost of transmission would be about 11 cents per megabyte. Uh, in contrast, if you go to the, 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 the published uh, price lists for communication using uh, low Earth uh, constellations that are available now, um, Iridium, um, I've seen prices as low as $7.41 per megabyte. Uh, Inmarsat, the, the BGAN Inmarsat service, uh, $6.49 per megabyte. Uh, Thuraya, uh, GMPRS Nova service, $5 a megabyte, which is uh, a couple of orders of magnitude higher. Um, and the, the, uh, the thing that, that, uh, that Mike was alluding to earlier, a couple of weeks ago I was talking with uh, um, um, somebody's name, of course I forget because I'm very old. Uh, the the uh, invented Java programming language, what's? Gosling, James Gosling, thank you. James, who is uh, speaking at JPL. He works for now for a company called uh, Liquid Robotics and they make uh, uh, robotic surfboards that, that, that um, uh, do science in the, in the middle of the ocean. They're, um, their communication model is they're in the middle of nowhere. Uh, they have no option but to talk with uh, through Iridium. 
and they are fairly heavy Iridium users. And what he told me is, oh, seven dollars a megabyte? No way. We pay a dollar per kilobyte, a dollar kilobyte to communicate from the middle of the ocean over uh, Iridium. Uh, so the I think I think eleven cents a megabyte is is actually a, a, like an, an attractive alternative, and uh, and and in fact we. I believe we could do a lot better than that because uh, the total capacity of the network really is limited by the data rates on the radios and the amount of uh, storage and processing power on the on the satellites. So storage and processing power, they're coming they're becoming cheaper pretty much all the time, and and we are now uh, coming to the point where C band or KU band radios are going to be available even in in form factors as small as these these cubesats. Um, so I, I think you can make a strong case that very inexpensive um, network service through this constellation is very feasible without any kind of miraculous scientific breakthroughs. So I think it's it's well within within techn technological uh, uh, plausibility right now. It doesn't matter in a sense because the higher data rate is not going to solve the end-to-end round-trip time problem. It's, it, it, the satellites only travel so fast. The latency in communication between the satellites and the ground stations is negligible because they're only 500 kilometers up. But the round trip latency in the network could be pretty bad, right? It's, it's going to be extremely variable and, and could be very high. And here's, here's a, an example of that. Suppose you've got a, a subscriber on a Saram Island in Indonesia. Um, and suppose the preceding hotspot on the orbital track that the satellite carries, uh, follows, is uh, Manado, which is 800 kilometers away, and maybe the next hotspot is Darwin, 1,200 kilometers away. Okay, so a round trip, uh, the the picture that I was showing before, a round trip uh, uh, data exchange over that over that that scenario would would take well, uh, 154 seconds of travel time from uh, Saram to Darwin before it can load the data into the internet, and 103 seconds from uh, Saram, um, sorry, from uh, Monado back to Saram on the return. The part that's on the internet, yeah, that's, that's negligible, but the satellite takes some time to move. So you've got a total round trip time of 4.3 minutes. Okay, so can a network be usable when the round trip time is five minutes? Uh, and that's, I think it's a, a fair question. Uh, I think it's a, a question that that's really the, the, the main point of what I wanted to talk about today. Well, DTN was originally devised uh, for automated network communication in uh, spaceflight missions, uh, where the, the round trip time between Earth and Mars can vary between uh, 8 and, and 40 minutes. So uh, for spacecraft operations, well, that's an application that, that clearly you have no choice. If you're going to do it at all, it's going to take that long. Uh, the network has to be uh, has to be acceptable, or else you don't have a network. You don't have communication. You might as well just stay here. So, and, and that's why we called it delay tolerant networking, because the networking would work over extremely long signal propagation delays, or other round trip delays caused by whatever, including uh, uh, interruptions in, in connectivity. And clearly, some network applications are completely stupid. You know, it would be useless to try to do Skype over uh, an eight-minute round trip time. It, 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 would, it would not be fun. It would not make any sense. Uh, teleconferencing, telnet, uh, SSH, there are lots of things that we can think of. But I will suggest that there aren't that many. There are plenty of things that we can think of, but not all of them. There are plenty of applications that, that we use all the time that I will suggest are innately delay tolerant applications that a round trip time of four minutes, 10 minutes, 30 minutes is not necessarily disabling to the application. Email, which was actually one of the models for DTN thinking right at the beginning, uh, you, you, it's, it's, it's nice when you can get a response email within a couple of minutes, but you don't really expect it. it, it you, what you expect is to send an email and you hope to hear something back from this person the next time they pick up email, which might be in an hour and a half. Um, news feeds, streaming news, streaming media, uh, uh, real time or, or, or just uh, uh, blogs, uh, weather advisories, crop reports, anything that is a, a one-way uh, transmission of data, there's no need for conversational network 
capacity to do that. It's, it's just fine to, to get that information when it arrives. And um, maybe a little bit uh, less obviously, uh, archiving, backups, uh, documentation of things, uh, taking photos of misbehavior at a, at a, at a, at a demonstration and, and, and loading them to, a, uh, to a, an archivable uh, uh, photo archive somewhere. Anything where the communication uh, is, where it's more important for the communication to be reliable and, and secure than that it be timely is perfectly delay tolerant application. And I think it doesn't stop there. Um, things like warning signals, distress signals, uh, uh, disaster relief, well, uh, you really want those things to go through as quickly as they can. And if you've got uh, high speed, uh, uh, connected uh, media to, to issue those things, terrific. If you don't, well, then having them get through eventually is better than having them not get through at all. So I think these two are, are uh, examples where eight minutes in, in, in delay in, in getting a cry for help out is a lot better than two days or never. Um, and, and even beyond that, uh, it, it seems to me that if you look at uh, a lot of social networking applications, now, they're not really necessarily conversational applications either. You, uh, you uh, post something on Facebook and you want everybody to see it, but they don't have to see it right now. You're not waiting for them to, to comment on it right now necessarily. If they see it in three minutes, that's not necessarily a problem. Uh, file transfer, media download. If you're downloading a movie, well, if you started a, a movie download and it took four minutes and you went out and you know, had a glass of milk while that was happening, well, that would necess not necessarily be a big problem. Um, and then a further class of applications that I think is even maybe less obvious uh, is, is e-commerce applications, electronic commerce, banking, shopping, things like that. Uh, and, and what I'll propose here is that um, taking a step back and, and thinking from you know, 45 years ago, anything that we used to do by mail that succeeded, and slowly, but succeeded when we were doing it by mail 45 years ago, you could do in a, a DTM-based network with eight-second round-trip times, and that would be a lot better than when it was a four-day round-trip time 45 years ago. It doesn't have to be conversational. It still can work. Uh, merchandise. We used to buy merchandise by mail order. The catalogs came in the mail. Uh, we essentially can do the same thing with, with Amazon right now, but suppose the catalogs arrived uh, over time and, uh, and maybe at night and you browse the catalog in the day after it happened. You don't necessarily have to be able to uh, ha be interactive with a catalog that is at a remote location. It would be a lot better to be interactive with a catalog that had been downloaded locally to your machine. Uh, bank statements, uh, your, all of your banking information. Well, the, the bank could stream that stuff to you overnight and when you go to uh, uh, balance your checkbook or whatever, uh, as long as the information is, is current, and it doesn't change that fast, it's much better for it to be residing locally in your machine so that you're not uh, 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 sending queries into, the, into the, the bank's servers and having go into the ether and nothing happens for uh, 15 seconds and then you say, oh, well, it must have gotten lost and you hit the button again and it goes the, the, the second time. In every case, the applications that, that are, are on a high latency network can provide, I believe, the same functionality way more quickly than, than with mail uh, and much more powerfully because now they can be uh, accompanied by graphics and automation and the same functionality and, and uh, uh, and, 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 and really more securely. Um, the pictorial sort of notion of this that, that I've been working with is, is something where um, in, in, imagine that, that uh, businesses, banks, have, they have branch offices. There are, there are banks that have branch offices. Well, suppose, suppose the bank, in, in addition to having branch offices, has twig offices. They're really small branches. And, and, and the twigs, the, t the twigs are, are downloaded to all their individual uh, depositors, uh, account holders' machines. So the, 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 the twigs are full implementations of, uh, of, of, the, of the bank software 
that are residing on customer subscriber machines rather than uh, on, the, on the remote server. So the interaction of the customer with that information is immediate, it's very secure, uh, it's not subject to, uh, to delay or, or loss over the, over the network, and uh, the small fraction of interactions that actually require coordination with the central uh, database of the server can all happen while the, while the user is, has said, oh yeah, do that, and walking away. Um, so sort of in that light, uh, I'd like to offer this, this perspective on, on using networks. Um, and, and it's that, that our concept of how to use a network ultimately derives from uh, what I understand is the origin of the internet, which was modulation, demodulation of data over, over telephone lines. We expect the network to operate like a telephone, only, only more. Uh, and a high latency network breaks that expectation. It doesn't operate like a telephone anymore. But communication that is non-telephonic, it's not that there's anything wrong with it. It's, it's, it's been around for a long time. It's not necessarily inconvenient. It's not necessarily inefficient. For uh, many communication applications, I will suggest that telephony really is overkill. You don't need it. And in some cases, and I think a, a pretty good example would be things like uh, the Affordable Care Act, and people have been having all these troubles getting through to the, to the servers to, to, to get into systems. Wouldn't it be better to just download that stuff to people's individual computers and then operate locally? And when you finally make a decision, you say, Here's the little bit of stuff that I really want to have happen. Well, now send that off. And that can happen uh, asynchronously from the point of view of the user. The, the, the user satisfaction, I think, is, would be actually a great deal higher. Um, oops. I don't know. OK. Turn that. OK. And, and from that perspective, uh, this is a, a diagram I've been sort of thinking about for a long time, that, that over time, communication sort of has two different, uh, completely different flavors. There's conversational, synchronous communication. There's epistolary, asynchronous communication. They're both completely valid and extremely valuable, and they're complementary and have been from the dawn of humanity. Uh, this timeline, well, yeah, we, we started, the initial communication, there wasn't much beyond speech, and then gesturing, right? Uh, uh, smoke, you know, flashing mirrors. And then a huge technological innovation, writing. And suddenly you could communicate with somebody who was not next to you because you could write something and hand the thing that you wrote to somebody who could carry it two miles or 200 miles to whoever it is that you're sending it to. Uh, domesticating the horse, another huge technological breakthrough that made communication, epistolary communication, much faster. Ships, now you could traverse really long distances. Uh, roads, real road building, which happened actually quite a long time after shipbuilding. Uh, another tremendous technological innovation. Horses moved a lot faster over roads than over open country. And the railroad, another leap forward. But then, finally, a leap forward in conversational, in synchronous communication in 1833 or so, the invention of the telegraph, and suddenly the the distance annihilation that you could get f only from, from written communications, you could now get in a conversational way. The telephone was an extension of that, radio, um, and, and things like communication satellites, and the internet all derive from that. But as distance increases uh, uh, even further, now that we're pushing into space, suddenly the conversational model, again, cannot handle the, the full range of everything we do. And I think that's where DTN comes in. The pendulum swings back and forth. We need both styles of communication. And I, and I think that, that a lot of the things that we, that we do on the internet right now would be perfectly fine in a, in a delay tolerant uh, network along the lines of the infrastructure I've been talking about. So a couple of quick caveats. Um, the core uh, implementation, uh, uh, the core protocol implementations for DTN I think are pretty mature. Uh, we're using them on Space Station, as we were hearing, hearing earlier. Um, there's still some supporting software that's needed. Uh, you need something to do the route computation in that, in that rather complex um, uh, uh, topology. Um, uh, you still need network management uh, protocols and tools, uh, and, and they need to be able to scale up to 
to what could be quite a large network, right? 150 satellites, 3,000 ground stations. There's a lot of network there, and that's, that's assuming you don't make it any bigger. Um, and security. I think security is a huge issue. Um, fortunately, um, uh, I, I believe the, the bundle security protocol and the security innovations that have been developed for uh, delay tolerant networking are um, actually pretty strong. Uh, I think, and we have those implemented already. There is still uh, a need, um, as, as Fred was, was uh, discussing earlier, we still need uh, a scalable uh, key distribution uh, system, but I think that's also uh, in grasp. Um, the, the real issue, I think, here is where does the funding come from to build this? Because there is not yet uh, a general perception that anybody can make any money from it. it, it when I first had this idea, I thought, well, this is great. It won't make any money. Better be great for providing uh, emergency communications to places that are devastated by earthquakes. It'd be great for communication to uh, underserved areas like refugee camps. Um, as I thought about it some more, I think that a lot of these applications that, that, that I think are, that I have recently come to, to think are, are in fact delay tolerant applications, uh, maybe motivate uh, a commercial um, argument for building an infrastructure like this. Uh, and that would be, that'd be great if something like that happened. In the meantime, uh, I, I think the idea has a lot of merit. Um, the, uh, the concept of DTN on satellites in low Earth orbit, as we discussed earlier, is, is well proven. Um, and I think the, the concept has some pretty clear advantages uh, as, a, as an adjunct to the way the Internet works today. It surmounts geographical obstacles. Uh, it's not disabled by earthquakes, floods, fires. It's actually difficult to disable intentionally. It's difficult to shoot down a satellite, especially a satellite that's this big. Um, the, it's a, there's a low barrier to entry in, in building the infrastructure, uh, a low operating cost over time, um, and, and it'd be, it would make it possible to offer Internet-like service to a, a, a vastly greater uh, fraction of the human population than we can offer right now. It would be a high latency network, and for some applications it would evidently be unsuitable. But for a lot of applications, I believe it would work as well as the Internet, and in some cases even better. Uh, and that's the conclusion of my presentation. Thank you very much. So uh, that's pretty breathless. Um, one question I have is whether we should uh, consider building a bunch of applications that are DTN-based and run them over the Internet so that uh, when you finally get this system up and running, we won't know the difference. And well, that, you know, this has uh, some advantages. It, we wouldn't, not all applications that would work on the internet will work over the right. uh, delay tolerant portion, but those things that are delay tolerant in the application sense wouldn't know the difference, and that's very uh, advantageous. So there's, there's, a, uh, there's a cost to, to modifying existing applications to do that. Uh, and, um, I think it'd be great to do that uh, in, in concept. It's not clear to me yet what the what the business case is for it, and we have to have a business case for somebody to do it. Uh, I, I will say that as a as a transitional alternative, what we have looked at and and it's been shown to work is running uh, IP over DTN. Uh, you, if you if you <laughs> it's bizarre, but. But what, you, but what you can do is uh, you can use the ton tap uh, interface at the bottom of the IP stack and, and, and insert uh, the bundle protocol in such a way that it looks like Ethernet and acts like Ethernet as far as IP is concerned. And, but, it, but it's a delay tolerant Ethernet. And once you've done that, well, any delay tolerant uh, Internet application automatically can take advantage of that. It just, it's just that non-delay tolerant uh, Internet applications wouldn't work over so well, but but as a way of of um, of ins insinuating uh, DTN technology into the networks, that is, you know, talking with the, the the telecoms and saying we would like to have some bandwidth to run this stuff in, alongside the IP traffic. Well, I think that's it, it, it's a it's a pathway to to having um, uh, capability in place that then you you could have. Applications that are native DTN applications have something to run over. Ben, I'd like to add to that. A perfect example on ISS is that the crew has live email syncs to the Outlook server on the ground. The flight director a couple weeks ago sent a 10 megabyte file to a crew member on an email and tried to create a T 
TCP correction and crash outlook. If we were able to VPN outlook, we would be not having these issues without programming space. Just one example. Uh, wait a minute. <laughs> <laughs> Bogon detector just went off. Uh, if you had put TCP over IP or you know email on top of TCP over IP over DTM, if the TCP is still there, it's going to time out. So that's not going to work. So, yeah, but but so anything that's that's UDP based, would, you, well, you would you'd be able to. Okay, this is starting to get more complicated. Yeah, it um, is. Yeah, that's, yeah. Oh, you should see how the stacks look. It's 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 pretty comical. Uh, yeah, Scott, uh, that's a very good uh, presentation. David Brin here. Um, I, I just wanted to mention a couple of things and then, then ask a question. One is that orbital planes are not as simple as perhaps you implied. Um, I, I, and I, let, me, uh, let me clarify by saying I, I, I'm a software developer. I'm not an aerospace engineer. So it's entirely possible that I got a bunch of this wrong. Well, well the... <laughs> Inserting, uh, for instance, replacement CubeSats into existing orbital planes where these things, for one thing, you get procession of nodes and they're all going to be separating in every which direction like, like a bunch of yeah, scattering. You, you need some sort, of, um, some sort of motive power on the satellites to be able to do No, what keep, you I need think. is you may need twice as many. And um, okay. in, in any event, a large number of your um, satellites are going to be dispersed not by dedicated launches but by parasitic uh, mm -hmm. riding on other people's launches. Sure. So it's so going to have to be very opportunistic. Right, they're going to be where they are. But, but that's also going to reduce your costs because they can be riding inside the fairings of, of other, of other um, that's what CubeSats do a lot. Uh, and of course you're going to have to have some provisions for deorbiting them. Mm -hmm. And you can do that with electrodynamic tethers uh, and, and things Although like that. Although my understanding is that at 500 kilometers, they're going to deorbit within five years, sort of by themselves. The orbit's going to decay, and they're small enough they're going to burn up. Yeah, but uh, the movie Gravity has sensitized us to this thing. Uh, in any event, I just wanted to ask you: um, Are you inspired to consider um, laser the lasers that we discussed earlier? Oh, sure. Um, and that would certainly uh, make this into a. Oh, yeah. Very, very big deal, and much, and they're compact as we've as we've seen. The other possibility is uplinking via ring road, mm -hmm. but then getting your downlink information via the big satellites like Viasat. Sure, that's and idea. Um, that way you 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 change the whole economics of the thing, the whole um, latency thing, because it's the uplink that's the real problem, mm -hmm. I believe. Um, but you can you can set up a dish and, and receive via stuff from Viasat. Uh, you, you can receive the files that you've ordered. Yeah. So that's you're a very interesting concept. Sure. Yeah. And the uh, one other thing on the on the optical, I, I think that actually would be terrific. My understanding is that uh, JPL at least is developing something that would be small enough to fit on a CubeSat that would be an optical uh, transmission device that doesn't exist yet. So I, I I didn't include it because I can't I can't cost it, but. But it's definitely coming. <laughs> to your, uh, this is Fred Templin from Boeing. To your point earlier about what the business model for this would be, uh, I might want to consider the possibility that we might not be just one of these, but many of these. Sure. Special purpose for the airline industry, for example, or special mm -hmm. purpose for government needs. Uh, militaries, uh, you can think of many different applications where they might want to have their own ring road mm -hmm. that's kept separate from, for, for example, the public ring road. And, and, and you could, uh, I, I believe you could easily imagine sort of virtual ring roads within a, a, maybe a, a, a very large single population of, 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 of satellites and right. uh, the, the, there might be uh, possibly multiple uh, coexisting nodes on a single satellite that right. are participating in in separate private uh, networks uh, right. and, and, and uh, drawing boundaries uh, uh, among them uh, by the uh, security protocols. Right, right. Sure. Okay. Thanks. I'm Einer Fulsang from Ames down the road. You should really come see us. We have a CubeSat system integration shop that I've, I've, uh, would I've love to talk to you. I've heard a lot about you guys, yeah. Okay, uh, in particular, what you showed was a picture of a 1U CubeSat. That's right. Almost nobody launches those anymore except universities who want to wow the grad students. Um, typically today they propose 2U, 3U, 4U, 6U, because you can cluster these things together. You only need one attitude control system, and uh, that leaves the rest of your space for payload. So you might want to ask yourself, what can I do with that extra payload? 
Well, one thing I could do is I could have a more powerful transmitter yep. uh, to get my data up and down. I could store more data. But another thing you might want to consider, and uh, this is not my field, so I'm just kind of bloviating here, but um, a lateral transfer. In other words, if I've got a sufficient population in my ring, and uh, it uploads on one instead of having to wait until I get to a good download spot, pass it to, the, to my neighbor, and mm -hmm. then have him pass it and pass it and pass it. You could do this very, very fast and uh, uh, almost conquer the, uh, uh, you know, the latency problem. But um, what I do like, though, is the fact that you've actually scaled a viable uh, uh, proof of principle concept that could actually make money. That's unusual. It could solve Maria's problem, okay? I, and I, now, I, uh, as, if your market picks up, if you prove that there's a market there in this manner, you can then start uh, putting up more satellites or putting up bigger satellites and uh, uh, start to attract more and more. You've got a growth model. Thanks. I think that's right. Yeah. Pardon me? Oh. Yeah. Look at, just as an aside, sorry, just one moment. I, I, I commend to everybody the Liquid Robotics website. These things are the coolest things you ever saw in your life. They're, they're these, like, they're, they're these, um, uh, Ocean-going robots that are like uh, large, thick surfboards that are completely self-propelled, using uh, using no fuel. They're, they're completely uh, uh, propelled through uh, to any point on the surface of, of Earth using just wave motion. I mean, they're, it's it's a it's a gorgeous, elegant design. Um. First thing I wanted to say is this is absolutely tremendous, you know, just a, oh, a wonderful, wonderful thing. And, and a lot of it is because um, I think the, it's just like rural, il, rural electrification. There's a lot of, of underserved population in the United States. And unfortunately, Internet access and network access is becoming a real divide. Everybody needs it. And if you don't have it, you're, you're out of the conversation. So it's very, very important. Um, having said that, I, um, I, I was trying to do the business around what you said, and, and um, you know, because um, as, the, as the gentleman said, there is, it, there's, I think there's obviously a money-making proposition here. And you know what? I mean, you just go down the road here. I mean, there's like row after row of venture capitalists. But what they're going to want to see is, a, is, I mean, if you want, I'd be happy. I've done zillions of venture presentations, unfortunately. Uh, uh, so I'd be happy to talk to you. Let, but, let, me, yeah. let me just interject here. I, I've like, in, in earlier younger days, I've, I've done like the, the VC kind of thing and, and tried to start that. And I, I recognize that that's not me. I'm actually not very good at that. But if, if somebody's interested in doing this, I'm very delighted to offer whatever technical support I can. I, I think this is uh, uh, the, the coolest, uh, uh, coolest thing going. I, I would love to work on this. Yeah, you, yeah, you need somebody for with business and time and Unfortunately, I'm overwhelmed. Otherwise, I think it's a tremendous idea. But somebody should really pick up on this. I, I so agree. <laughs> uh, any other questions? Oh, yes, please. So, so the, the, the question is, uh, when I was quantifying the demand, I was using network capacity as the, as the metric, and has there been any quantification of the the actual demand from the potential customer base, and uh, um, and I would say no. I I, have, I haven't tried to do anything like that. I have assumed, and this may not be correct, but I've assumed that that whatever uh, whatever bandwidth were made available this way would be consumed by uh, uh, some activity or other at, at the at the least. You know, uh, people in the middle of you know Pango Pango would be downloading. You know, Tom Cruise movies. You know, I'm, I'm sure that the, the 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 bandwidth would get used. Uh, uh, the the things that I think are are um, real constraining factors are, are how much it, how much it's going to cost, how much they, how much people can afford, uh, uh, and, and if you if you don't price it uh, price it so high that that the the people who recognize the the value of of, of the the service. Uh, can't afford it, 
then I, I believe it would be fully subscribed. Uh, any, any other questions? Oh, sorry. Yeah, I, I work in the field a lot with projects, um, not quite like the reindeer, but uh, we're in the field a lot um, with dolphins and whales, mostly photographing the babies after they've been born. And I'm usually on uninhabited islands where we have no communication at all, but this is more of the delayed material that we would get out. But the real-time material we need in case there's an emergency, because we see a lot more sharks than we do whales. And um, I'm just thinking that some of the um, – outreach that we have as far as like we have about a 300 million viewership on one of our brands that we don't actually launch yet but if we put it together with something that's needed and go to the entertainment industry to talk about what you're doing in the development with a good story it might be something they could lock in with uh with the lady who's doing there maybe we could talk a little bit about it i, I uh in in a sense i th i can i can imagine sort of this this concept uh, even without the, the cross-link sort of idea that, 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 that was mentioned earlier, just, just the, the, the vertical up and down and carry thing as, as a um, uh, high bandwidth, you know, mass uh, uh, data movement at, at very low cost mechanism that would be uh, supplemented by a conversational mechanism that, that, uh, that Iridium gives you. So that if you have an emergency, you don't mind spending a dollar, a kilobyte, for, for uh, immediate uh, phone call uh, connectivity, uh, and for for a lot of other activity, uh, the, the 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 fact that it takes a long time it just doesn't doesn't bother you. Uh, mm -hmm. And and on, on that basis, I think yeah, I think the, the the sort of model you're talking about yeah, that's that's certainly something to um, uh, uh, to consider. You you, uh, you your sharks and whales thing is uh, the point is is certainly well taken, and I think there's room for both. Yeah, uh, particularly one particular production company I have in mind that we're talking to right now, it's on the IMAX sphere, but I think they, they have a high interest right now, and this is something that would sit quite well with them, I think, and well, it's approachable. I'm, yeah. uh, I'm glad to talk to anybody. Sure. Thank you. Uh, anything else? Okay, thank you very much.